So you got your hands on a 3D printer and some filament, and you wanna start making your own awesome cosplay and props. But before you can go from a roll of filament to a finished product, there are five things you should know before getting into 3D printing cosplay. Let's talk about it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Frank and you've done it. You've got your 3D printer because you wanna start making awesome cosplay or props. You wanna 3D print Iron Man suits and He's on vacation, don't worry about it. But you wanna start making these awesome things, but you do need more than the printer and some filament. So today, I wanna to talk about that. In this video, I wanna cover five crucial skills that I think you're gonna to need to learn in order to advance into 3D printing your cosplay and props. Scaling the 3D files, cutting up the 3D files, using the 3D prints back together, getting them to actually fit your body and wearing them, and finally painting them. So let's not waste any time and jump right in. Let's talk about scaling. Scaling 3D prints to fit you can be an absolute nightmare and lead to so much wasted filament. I scaled this Deadpool helmet way too small. Imagine doing that to a whole suit. I'm speaking from experience. Now there are a couple free ways to really nail down scaling and some ways that might cost you a little bit of money. Personally, the first thing I think you should do is go get your hands on the cosplay calipers. And I'll link that down below, very easy to find and print out. And if you want a tutorial on how to better understand and use a cosplay caliper, go check out Uncle Jesse's video here. I've never personally done a video on it, though I've done scaling videos, but he's really awesome and go tell him Frank sent you and just make fun of him. But this is gonna help you better measure your head and body parts and then translate it into 3D space. Most 3D printing programs have some type of measurement tool where you can at least see the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the thing you're trying to print. If that cosplay caliper tells me my head is only like this wide, but then I go and translate that or measure a helmet in the 3D modeling program and it says it's 20 feet long, obviously something's wrong. Now you can go and print it out and find out, but I don't want to waste all that film. My favorite thing to do is print out test rings. Now I know I printed this in black and it is very hard to see, but this is the bottom section of a Master Chief helmet. It's literally the exact same part. I just took a plane cut, cut off the bottom of the helmet, and just printed out this part. Now, if this fits my head, it touches my ears a little bit, but theoretically now, yeah, it just touched my ears a little bit. It fits. This test ring trick can be applied to so many applications, not just helmets. You can use it for entire armors too. Yes, you're gonna have to waste some filament, but I'd rather print off one or two of these to know that the entire helmet's gonna fit instead of just hip firing an entire helmet only to find out that it just doesn't fit at all. Now don't worry if you're not sure how to cut up 3D files quite yet like that. We're gonna go over that in the next step, but there are a few other scaling things I wanna talk about first. Now these two methods are gonna cost you some money. The first one is Armorsmith. It is about 35 or $40. It's right here on the screen. This is a 3D scaling program and it's gonna let you make a 3D avatar and size and scale it to the right height and shape and weight and it's gonna give you body dysmorphia because it just makes you look real weird and chonky damn boy he thick boy but it's gonna allow you to drop in your 3d armor and pieces into the file and scale them now it's not an exact science it's not perfect but it's gonna get you a lot closer rather than just printing out an entire Iron Man suit and hoping it fits. Again, ask me how I know. The other option is a 3D scanner. Now, you don't need to go and drop $1,000 on a 3D scanner. Most modern iPhones and Samsung S9s, there's a lot of free 3D scanning software out there. And maybe you don't have an iPhone, but maybe your friend does. Your buddy can just scan your head with or scan your entire body, and then you have a perfect reference for scaling your armor. You'll know if it fits. It's kind of only something you need to do once, so maybe you don't need a 3D scanner, but you can at least get a scan of yourself, and that'll just help you in the long run. If you want more information on scaling specifically, I have two separate videos on that, scaling helmets and scaling armor that goes into a lot more depth about it. But if you kind of feel comfortable just downloading the program and playing with it, Armorsmith isn't that hard to use. Now, once you get the 3D scaling down and you think you're in the right ballpark, well, now it's time to talk about actually cutting up the 3D files because sometimes, 3D files can be a little bit bigger than the printer you're printing them on. So 3D printer beds come in all shapes and sizes, but realistically, you can print anything on any size 3D printer. I can print this big Iron Man suit or this giant sword that's standing up behind me on this tiny little 3D printer bed. I'm just gonna have to cut it up a lot more. Now I can talk at length at this and fill entire videos. As a matter of fact, I have. I have entire tutorials on cutting and sizing and scaling 3D prints, but the main thing you just need to understand is the plane cut feature. Now, if you just download Orca Slicer or Bamboo Studio, and I think Prusa Slicer has an option for it, you can see that some of these 3D prints don't fit on these beds, especially this giant sword blade right here. If you go up here just to cut, 
It's gonna give you the option to move around and you can just drag this. It's just a butcher's block. It's just gonna slice the 3D print in half. And it always defaults to the dead center. So if I hit cut, that's directly in the middle. Perform the cut. It's just gonna lop it in half. Now I have two parts. Now I can go and select it again, cut it again, and just hack and slash it. Now, obviously something the size of like a seven foot sword, I'm gonna have to cut it down a lot. I might even have to cut it down vertically as well. But you know, even something like this little Wolverine mask here, you go select it, you can hit cut, and then you can rotate it at exactly 90 degrees. Now I can cut it into two parts. And believe it or not, with a little bit of trickery, you can get the cut part to fit on a bed just like this by rotating it. So play around with the feature and you'll be able to kind of manipulate and get more 3D prints to fit. Obviously, if you have a 3D print that's super detailed, like the top of the Wolverine mask, if it doesn't fit your printer and you need to cut it, you're gonna have to be real creative with some of your cuts or you're gonna just have to go through detail. That's the unfortunate side. While you can print anything on any printer, sometimes if there's detail or texture involved, it can make fusing it all back together a little difficult. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next section, but go ahead and play with this. The other program I really like for this, while a little old and I don't think it works on Macs, sorry, is a program called Mesh Mixer. And I've shown this in videos before. It also has an edit and then you go to plane cut feature. And it's the same method as Orca Slicer. However, when you go and select and cut everything, you select slice, keep both and hit accept. It keeps everything where it was. And until you go to separate shells, then it's gonna actually separate the parts, but it keeps them in the same 3D space where Orca Slicer after I cut it, it just dropped it to the build plate. And that can get a little confusing. If you want to go and make detailed, intricate cuts without the parts all getting jumbled around, I like Mesh Mixer for this because it really helps you better understand and visualize where you're making the cuts. Now there's a lot more you can do. You can add connectors, you can do dovetail cuts. Know that that feature's there and it'll help you fit multiple 3D print or large 3D prints on a 3D printer. All right, now you know how to cut up your 3D prints. Well, what about after you print them out? How do you fuse them back together? Hmm. So now you have a bunch of 3D prints you need to put back together. Now, if it's just for mostly a display, I really have no problem with things like super glue. However, I would very much recommend a two-part super glue, a cyanoacrylate, where you have the glue itself and you have an activator. This is some of the strongest stuff I've ever used. If you don't want to use something like this, you have options like 3D glue, normal super glues, just different epoxies, however you want to hold them together. But honestly, if it's just this simple little connection and you're not going to be doing much with it or it's for a display, this stuff works great. Not bad, instantly dry. And I could go and post-process this and paint it and make it all look pretty and nice, which we're gonna talk about later, but there are stronger methods. Now, say you want a strong bond. Say you want something that's really not gonna come apart. And you know what? We're gonna use this as the example. My personal favorite method is PLA welding. And for that, I use a soldering iron. Now I have a whole video dedicated to this and explaining it in depth, but what you're basically doing is taking a wood burner or a hot soldering iron and literally melting the plastic together. There is no stronger bond. It is the same as metal welding. You are mixing the two materials, the similar materials, to back together into one structure. Now to do this, I always take just a little bit of super glue just to hold and tack the parts together. Now you wanna be very careful and do this in a ventilated area because if that soldering iron touches that super glue, it's gonna vaporize it into a gas. And that stuff does not feel good in your eyes. Ask me how I know. So again, do as I say, not as I do, please. I don't wanna be responsible for you going blind. So I'm just gonna tack these two parts together. And now that they're more or less held together, I'm gonna to take my soldering iron and actually start just melting the parts. And you can go all the way through the parts. You can just do the seams or edges. It's just gonna change how strong the part is. And I'm just going along the seams and I'm just folding the melted plastic back into itself and just trying to smooth it down. And you can adjust this and play with the different temperatures of the soldering iron. This one is uh, actually adjusted. Adjustable. So I'm just trying to smooth out the edge. And if there's a little bit of a bump or it's not perfect, you can clean this up in post-processing. If you're gonna be sanding and painting it, why not? You can also take scrap material and actually melt it into the channel if there's like a gap or anything. But this lined up pretty nicely, so I can just go and fold this on. That's it. This blade is now theoretically one piece. I could absolutely sit here and try to snap it apart, but why would I do that? I just welded it together. But this is so much stronger 
than any other method. Now I broke it apart to show you how deep I did not weld it. Again, I only went through the like the little edge surface area and you can see where the super glue was, but you can see it also ripped off some layers together where I did weld it. This is one of those methods that however much time you take with it and practice, you're gonna get better and you're gonna start to better understand the parts that do need really deep welds versus the parts that only need some surface level stuff. Now, once you combine this with post-processing and sanding and smoothing, you can get real seamless looks. There was a weld here and there was a weld on this blade too. And as long as you take your time sanding and smoothing, you'll never be able to even tell that it was there. And that just, just comes with practice and time. And this method can be applied to literally anything you're 3D printing, whether it's props or daggers or little display pieces or full armor cosplay because you had to cut it up a lot because you had a small 3D printer. Just PLA welding or fusing the parts together can really go a long way. Now, obviously, if there's a lot of details and stuff in the way, you're not gonna be able to use the soldering iron and you know, fold and weld the plastic together. So you're gonna have to pick and choose when and where you can use this. Kind of take it in and just add it to your tool belt, but it's definitely a useful skill or the things like 3D glue and just kind of combine it all together. But with that, now that you've printed out your pieces and you've scaled them and all of that and you've fused them back together, probably the most important thing, or well, I think the most important thing is actually being able to wear the costume. So let's talk about that. So. Tip number four, actually wearing and putting this stuff on. How are you attaching the 3D printed parts to each other or your body or your costume? Like what's going on here? Well, first off, helmets. Honestly, these are probably the easiest thing to wear and make comfortable. It's just a bunch of foam on the inside. My favorite stuff to use for this is sound deadening foam. You can get bricks of this stuff so cheap on Amazon and it's thin, it's light, it's kind of breathable and it's super, it's super easy to cut. And that's literally all that's in my Mandalorian helmet. And it's a little bit of trial and error and it stays on. Perfectly. I even have some of this scattered around my Iron Man suits, like under some of the armor parts, so they don't make as much noise when they rattle around. They make parts more comfortable. It's super cheap and just easy to get. On top of that, you can just get rolls of EVA foam or packing foam or really whatever you want to use. I've actually seen people order the inserts for like motorcycle helmets or bicycle helmets and just Velcro those inside the helmet. I think that's a little bit more of an expensive method, but it works. As for actually wearing and putting this stuff on, there are a billion ways to do this. In the case of my Iron Man hands, these are just a white elastic bands that I glued to the insides of the fingers. This way everything kind of stays together. The insides of the arms are just a mishmash of elastic bands and you know really cheap plastic buckles you can get on Amazon and everything just disconnects. Parts of the chest here are just held on with a bunch of magnets. Same with things like that. You can get various size elastic bands and nylon straps super cheap on Amazon or places like Hobby Lobby. And gluing these to your suit's pretty easy. That same cyanoacrylate glue I was using earlier, loves soaking into this stuff and it holds it really well on the plastic parts. Simple Velcro also goes a really long way. Plastic buckles in various shapes and sizes for making your own harnesses. And magnets, man, do I love magnets. These are purse clasp magnets. These are self-centering magnets that uh, I use on a lot of stuff. I actually just use them on my giant cannon there. They're super cheap and easy to get, come in a bunch of different sizes. And you can also get really strong neodymium bar magnets. These are actually kind of dangerous. These are incredibly strong magnets. While difficult to attach to certain parts, you gotta be real creative with how you glue these down and where you put them. But like you saw before, you can really hold some stuff together. While you're trying to put on and wear your costumes, you're gonna mix and meld a lot of these methods together. This suit is littered with different techniques. Heck, I've even recently added some, um, Keychain carabiners, these retractable lanyards for holding the arm up. This way I don't have to. Just with the people I know who also have Iron Man suits, every single one of our costumes are built completely differently. They are all assembled differently with different methods. While I'm using elastic, they're using magnets or Velcro or straps, or they sewed on parts to their undersuit. Like there is just no one perfect way to do it. The perfect way to do it is whatever works for you. Now, you guys already might be noticing that I saved painting for the end. And well, why wouldn't you wanna paint and sand everything before you rig it and fit it to yourself? Well, that's so you don't scratch now, I don't have it here, but my red Iron Man suit, here it is on the screen. Aww. I made that mistake with that suit. I actually got done printing it and sanding it and smoothing it, made it look real pretty and nice. And then I decided to try to tackle wearing it and putting it on and adding the buckles and straps and resizing it and having to... It was a nightmare. So I will recommend that you save the painting for last. Obviously this won't always apply on every piece. It'd be a real pain in the butt to try to paint all these fingers once they were all glued together. But for the most part, try to fit your pieces to your body first. Make sure you can wear it, make sure it's comfortable, and then worry about making it pretty and cleaning it up and sanding and painting it. So uh, how about we talk about that part now? So last but not least, 
painting or post-processing, getting the 3D printed thing to look not 3D printed. Well, this could be literally an entire YouTube channel worth of videos and tutorials and tips. And again, just like the fitting it to you, there's no perfect one way to do this. You can 3D print stuff pretty nice now where you don't need to post-process it. This is a Deadpool helmet. No one would argue with that. The filament and the printers are getting a lot better. Now with that, if you want to start making the stuff look prettier, start making it look shinier, metallic, or however you want to do it, well, you can do things like spray painting, airbrushing, hand painting, uh, automotive HVLP spray guns. There are boundless options when you want to get into finishing and post-processing. Now again, what's going to come with this is just practicing and figuring out what works for you. Me personally, I love my spray paints. I show it in so many videos, both of my Iron Man suits, literally every prop in this room, except like the black blade on Yoru, that was airbrushed because I needed like super dark Vanta black. And some people would tell me I'm crazy for spray painting. Why not use an airbrush? There's just no one perfect way to do it. When you're sanding and smoothing, you have to put in the work. There are filler primers. There are smooth on uh, epoxies to smooth out layer lines. There's UV resin curing. There's airbrushing certain materials on. There's a lot of options for just getting the 3D print smooth. And then you can move into the paints and actually playing with different colors and methods, but you have to practice. Now I myself am working on newer and updated tutorials for newer painting methods and new smoothing and sanding methods. But really, I could tell you how to do it a hundred times, but if you don't practice it, none of it's going to matter. If you're in the 3D printing hobby, you're going to have failed prints. You're going to have prints that are too small or wasted or messed up. Use those as practice. Take your power tools to them, sand them down, smooth them, hit them with different spray paints, see about getting different shines and sheens. You just gotta put in the work. But honestly, day after day, it's getting less and less required to have to actually paint 3D prints. This is all 100% a raw print and it looks great. Well, I think so. And hopefully I can show you this right now. This video should be out by the time I reveal this. Yeah, I, you can probably figure out who this is. No, it's not a Gundam. You got the touch. Practicing and working on refining your post-processing skills is that last little thing that's gonna take your 3D printed cosplay to the next level. I'm not calling anybody out here because however much time you have to put into the project, and if you're happy with the results, be happy. Do not worry about what anybody else thinks. But if you're posting it on social media, obviously other people can see it. And that's probably one of my biggest complaints with some people's props and cosplay. They didn't put the work into the post-processing aspect of it. And it could just be that little bit of extra in that costume that really sets it over the edge. Now, by all means, I have absolutely rushed some projects myself and I'll look back at pictures and be like, man, I wish I had sanded that a little bit more. Hey, it happens. But not being afraid to embrace it and just practicing can really go a long way. But with that, I don't really think there's much left to offer in terms of tips or, well, at least the basic five tips I'd recommend. So guys, that's pretty much gonna wrap it up for this video. I just wanted to give you some options to think about when you're actually gonna start getting into 3D printed cosplay. Just things to chew on and start considering when you're gonna start making these types of larger props and costumes. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns about anything you saw in the video, please leave some comments down below. And if you absolutely hated the video, leave a comment. Let me know why. Maybe I'll read it or put it in the next video. Who knows? But if you did like what you saw, please consider subscribing to the channel. This way you stay up to date on all the videos I have coming out, new projects, maybe a new Iron Man suit to replace this one that's... He's somewhere. He'll call. He always calls. But I think that's going to be a wrap for this video, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching. You have a good day.